lots of people sort of moving in. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our pre-concert talk. I'm so thrilled you're here on this beautiful fall day. Um, as usual, I have uh, a wonderful partner, and you know her very well, uh, to do these pre-concert talks. So please give a warm welcome to Lori Shulman. Good afternoon, everyone. Wonderful to be back in Fort Worth. I apologize for missing your first two concerts of the season, but I had a really good reason. I was in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very, very happy to be back here, and I appreciate you sending the rain out of town and ordering this gorgeous autumn weather, as Gary mentioned. We don't have very many leaves left in my part of Virginia, but yours are still in their full glory, and it was delightful driving over to the modern today. And it's really, really nice to see all of you again. I was so happy when I saw what Gary had programmed for this afternoon because his title, Evolution, encapsulates so much of this all 19th century program. That's fudging it a little bit because the first Beethoven sonata is sort of from the late 1790s. 1797, eight, yeah. But I think they were published in 1800. Exactly. So we're going to fudge that date a little bit and say it's an all 19th century program. The title evolution really applies mostly to the Beethoven works on this program. And I'm just gonna give you a really brief music history lesson. There are 32 Beethoven piano sonatas. They date from the very early stages of his career in the 1790s to the very tail end of his career right before the Ninth Symphony. They effectively, they span his entire compositional development. There are 10 violin piano sonatas. They are almost all early works. You might call the Opus 31 sonatas, excuse me, Opus 30. Yeah. There, there are three Opus 30 violin yeah. sonatas yeah. and three Opus 31 piano sonatas. Anyway, um, you could call them on the cusp of his middle period. The Kreutzer Sonata is very definitely from his middle heroic period. And the very last sonata, the 10th, Opus 96, is sort of just peering into the late period. But it is not a comprehensive view of Beethoven's style. The five cello sonatas, on the other hand, are a microscopic view that f they... Ap We're getting a little bit of an echo down yeah, here. Yeah, too much echo. Anyway, we... Uh, Better. <laughs> We have five cello sonatas. The first two are opus five. They're very early, contemporary, even a little earlier than this first violin sonata. The middle sonata, which we're going to hear, is from the heart of Beethoven's so-called heroic decade, but it is not a heroic work. It's a very lyrical work that even relates him to Schubert, but does show enormous evolution in his style. And the last two sonatas, opus 102, are very definitely late Beethoven. So what we're going to be exploring today is the C seeds of genius in his very early works and the enormous leaps that he makes as a composer when we leapfrog forward to the Opus 69 cello sonata, this gorgeous, gorgeous piece in A major. Uh, why don't we start by listening to how he opens the Opus 12 number one sonata. It can only be described as a fanfare. May we hear track one, please? <laughs> So Gary, who had Beethoven been studying with? Well, he was studying with the gentleman right there, Franz Josef Haydn. And I think one of the reasons that we chose this very opening in the violin sonata is because it's a complete contrast for what Haydn probably would have uh, uh, prescribed, if you will. There's a, the great David Horowitz shtick where Horowitz imagines what Haydn would have said to Beethoven, for example, for the Fifth Symphony, because Haydn, in, in this stick, he says, well, you know, you don't want to do this. You want a nice, slow introduction. Let people relax and settle in their seats. And Beethoven says, no, da-da-da-dum. 
So this is exactly what you got over here, and something, if it's something that uh, Haydn would have written probably would have let you relax and do something slow, and then there's a allegro main theme, but in this case, right away, octaves, you know where you are. And just one thing that I just want to mention to you in this Opus 12, number one sonata, you would think that 27-year-old Beethoven, who was at the time really known for his piano writing and his piano playing, would not be fully cooked. He would not be this skilled at writing for these two instruments, even though it's a piano and violin sonata, but you get something that is completely polished early Beethoven. In our second example, I've uh, done a clip from the development section. We're going to hear the violin with a little variation on that opening theme, but there's little Phillips, little commentaries, they're kind of hiccups in the piano that are sort of very humorous and very dramatic. There's sort of a, an odd mixture there, while the violin material is really a lot more uh, legato. It's a, a significant contrast in texture. Let's hear track two, please. And then, of course, we have the recapitulation and the restatement of that very decisive stand up and notice me arpeggio. Indeed. One thing that you will listen for, I think, this entire sonata is full of humor. And that, I think, is a real tip in the hat to Haydn. Because this is not the Beethoven with the wild hair. This is that Beethoven right there who's a young man, and he really has an enormously powerful and quick-witted sense of humor. And you get that in every movement, including the variation movement. This is also before his hearing started to go, and effectively, if I may use a well-worn cliche, the world was his oyster. He had everything to live for, and his joy in life comes through in every movement of this sonata. We're going to go to the second movement now. Uh, it is a theme with variations, and the piano has the first statement of the theme. This example gives us the violin's first entrance, which is effectively the second statement of the same theme. Track three, please. The warmth of the string sound really puts us in a very different space here, doesn't it? You, you mentioned Schubert, and to me, this is exactly this is Schubert's writing. And I, I'm not saying he necessarily borrowed it from Schubert. I know it's uh, it's original, but it's the kind of effortless melody that permeates this entire slow movement. There's nothing contrived about it. It just sort of comes from God, and it's amazing. These variations are conventional in the sense that Beethoven adheres to traditional variation format. My next example is the one that's going to be in minor mode, and there's usually one that's in a slower tempo, and he'll usually end with possibly a change in meter and something really light and upbeat. But I've chosen variation three for the next example. This is our example four. It's in D minor rather than A major, and it's agitated a certain, no, it's in, it's in A minor. This, a minor. This, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. This uh, variation is in A minor. What you just heard was in A major. And it's agitated, and it's got these surging outbursts, a lot of drama, and as Gary has pointed out to me, we already have hints of the fully mature Beethoven. Let's listen to track four, please. Can you comment on the relationship between piano and violin here? Absolutely. It's, it's an equal relationship. And uh, the thing that I think we should really keep in mind is the Kreuzer Sonata, which is the ninth sonata. 
was pretty much published within a year of this. So not all of these were written, one through nine were written around 1801, 1802, publishing anyway. And then that last G major, the 10th sonata, was 1810, really 1811. So the, the, the amount of time that it took him to compose these, clearly he had sketches already. And as the, the other thing that you should really know about is there are composers like Mozart, Shostakovich, um, they had the talent to just write it down. Um, Beethoven had hundreds, if not thousands of pages of sketches. And you can see that this kind of variation movement is so related to the variation movement of the Kreuzer Sonata that there's no question in my mind that he tried certain things in this first sonata and then therefore went out and refined it in the ninth sonata really within one year of, of its publishing. So there's no question he was already writing it for many of these sonatas at the same time. That stated, I do want to point out that these sonatas were all being published as sonatas for the pianoforte with the accompaniment of violin. Exactly. What is unusual about the way Beethoven wrote them is that he's clearly making the violin an equal partner. And it's even a more equal partnership when we get to the cello sonata in a few minutes, one of the advances that Beethoven has made. Uh, our last example from this first violin piano sonata, it's a hunting rondo. And again, the piano opens with the main theme, but my example is chosen from the first violin entrance, which is an it's an echo, but it's more of a restatement because the piano texture changes to accommodate its conversational role with the violin. It's, it's actually really cool because we are using obviously a modern piano and I'm not playing you know, in, in a historically informed instrument. So that instrument would be very, very different from the Steinway that's in front of you. And the articulation that we both get to use actually emphasizes the difference between the keyboard and the string instrument. The example concludes with, uh, oops, we're going a little bit ahead to Dvorak here. <laughs> yes, we, the example concludes with a spill into the first episode. A rondo has the main part that recurs, and then you'll have an episode, and then a recurrence of the rondo, and then another contrasting episode. This first episode immediately goes into flourishes for both instruments, and this one has a descending scale in the violin in major mode, and then the piano answers with an ascending chromatic scale. The descending scale in major mode is very violinistic. The ascending chromatic scale for the piano is very pianistic. Mm -hmm. So he's really settling into this conversation has some variety to it, but he's also playing games. And once again, it's an excellent example of the humor to which Gary alluded a few moments ago. May we hear track five, please? <laughs> Explain to me, why is this humorous? Well, there's, why is this humorous? There's so many different reasons. For one thing, there's a bounciness to it. Um, and the string instrument, I think, is much more open to it, I would say. I don't want to say more open, but certainly it's, it's, a, it's a much more bouncy way of using the bow and just kind of getting everybody to, to tap their toes to it. Um, I think that the, the forte piano would probably would, would have been uh, less percussive and certainly less uh, uh, projection. Um, and the, that contrast to me in, in this recording also uh, was really kind of easy to get because that contrast is already written into the music. You just have to go with the tune, if you will. Gary is being very modest, but I would like to point out that that is his recording of Opus 12, number one, with his beautiful and gifted wife, Baya Kakuberi. Yeah. And we, we both love that recording, and it's a very precious one emotionally as well as musically. We are going to move now to the Opus 69 cello sonata. This is at the height of Beethoven's middle period during his so-called heroic decade. But this is not an example of his heroic writing. It is an example of classic middle period Beethoven where he is completely secure in what he is doing as a composer. And I would like to point out that with his Opus 5, the very early pair of cello sonatas, he was the first composer since the Baroque era to write anything that treated the cello as something other than a continuo instrument. And the opening of this Opus 69 sonata, there is no piano at all. It's just this gorgeous cello theme 
reveling in the resonant warmth of the tenor range of the cello. Let's listen to track six, please, the opening theme. So what we have here is a total shift in balance. The spotlight is clearly on the cellist. Everything is relaxing and warm and lyrical. When the piano creeps in, it's with a very subtle underpinning of an accompaniment figure. And then all of a sudden the piano says, wait a minute, what about me? And goes off into this little mini cadenza, asserting its so own. So basically every ingredient you're going to hear in this movement is stated in the first eight bars. Yes. So he, he basically yes. says to you, here's the menu of what I'm about to compose so that you're ready for. You've got the solo. You've, you've got the answer in the piano, and you have the credential, really almost opera writing, that finishes that phrase. It's really quite something. And the next example, which occurs almost directly on the heels of what we just heard, is a an outburst in minor mode. I don't want to call it a minor outburst, but it's a major <laughs> outburst in minor mode, because again, he's saying, wait a minute, sit up and notice me. This is about getting you to sit ramrod street in, uh, straight up in your chairs and just acknowledge that something very dramatic is going on, but nothing dark and turbulent. It's just a get your attention thing. Let's hear track seven, please. <laughs> And what that is going to make the transition to is another total change of character. I'd like to point out that historically, in a sonata form movement, you would have a first and second theme that were very different in character. But in this case, the transition is different in character. Both the first and the second themes are very lyrical and leisurely. I want to point out that, just like in the violin sonata, he does very much break from the way Haydn would have written. And there's no formula to it. You know, I'm going to go with the first theme group, development, and we're going to do these other things, parallel minor. He just basically is in drama already. And as in the violin sonata, you're going to hear a lot of what's called shock dynamics, meaning that it is not a prepared outburst. We usually you would have a crescendo and then getting to a forte. Here you might be in piano and all of a sudden in forte. And the converse is also true where suddenly the bottom drops out in the middle of a phrase because that is his already his signature. My next example is from the scherzo and then right on its heels we'll hear an example from the trio. Uh, the scherzo is very clearly related to a couple of the earlier violin sonatas, I'm going to ask Gary to weigh in on that after we hear it, uh, but it, what you're going to hear is lightning fast and very, very syncopated. Let's listen to track eight, please. Okay, Gary, which sonata for violin and piano does this remind you of? The, the, of course, the spring. Um, the, the scherzo, well, first we should remind our audience that scherzo in Italian means joke. And so much like many of early Beethoven scherzos, this truly is a joke, unlike Brahms scherzos, which are all tragic and scary. Um, but in this case, what, what is he doing? He's moving the beat off of one instead of something that maybe a lesser composer would have written everything on one. Bam, da, da, ba, ba, bam. He says, da, ba, ba, da, da, da. Almost maybe looking forward to jazz. In a way. What, what would Beethoven have done if he was in New Orleans at the time? What? Or, a completely different cello sonata. <laughs> and I would point out that in his very last piano sonata, which is Opus 113, he has a variation that pianists have dubbed the boogie woogie variation. That's it. So Beethoven definitely he got the jazz it. gene. He was just started a it. century ahead of his time. Yep. Okay. Our next example is from the trio section of that same scherzo. It is, I like to think of this as hummingbird wings. Let's listen to track nine, please. 
So that's not a trill, is it? That's just it. I'm so glad you mentioned it. A trill, as you can imagine, is this very similar pattern, but it's usually on over two notes. So you have a main note and the note above it. Well, what is he doing here? He's taking one main note and going immediately to another main note with a trill above that. So no, it's not a trill, but it's a very quick sort of a, a dexterity exercise and something all of us will always do. Um, Popper did it for the cello, Schrodinger did it for the violin, and the whole idea is that you have independence of fingers so you can switch between one, two, and two, three, and three, four without any oral notice, notification at all. And the result is a very rapidly repeated pattern, which is essentially what you get with hummingbird wings. That's it. They go so fast that you can barely see that they're even moving. All right, we are going to have a major shift now to the late 19th century and the Czech composer, I beg your pardon, we have one more example from the finale. That's it. My apologies. My cheat sheet cheated on me. <laughs> <laughs> the finale is preceded by a very short introduction which doesn't even qualify as a slow movement, but it serves the function of a slow movement. And then it morphs into this gorgeous theme, which I think is up there with the canonical theme of the Franck Sonata as the most gorgeous A major theme in the chamber Absolutely. music literature. Let's hear track number 10, please. <laughs> They are obviously in show-off mode. That isn't that gorgeous theme. Believe me, you'll know when you hear it. It is very beautiful. But what's happening here is that he has not only sent them into very rapid passage work, they're both playing really high in their register, That's just it. which is a lot more difficult for the cello than it is for the piano. Right, because the fingerboards were so short. The whole idea at the time was that you were never going to be playing in those positions, so why put a piece of wood to support the fingers there? And that was something that actually got changed in the 19th century. But at the time, I can imagine this is something that would have been almost impossible to play because you don't have the support to play in high positions. So in summary, before we leave Beethoven for Dvorak, what I'd love for you to be listening to most carefully this afternoon is the conversational exchanges between the two instruments in both the violin piano sonata and the cello piano sonata, and how much more sophisticated and adventuresome Beethoven has become in taking this instrument, the cello, which had only 50 years before, been an instrument largely relegated to a continuo role and making it absolutely front and center in the musical. Real solo instruments only. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, now we move to the late 19th century, another chamber music favorite of all of ours, Antonin Dvorak. The title of this piece, the subtitle of it, is the Dumki Trio. It has nothing to do with being dumb. The singular is Dumka which is a bohemian Czech term that is associated with literature and a ballad that would vary from mournful, introspective lamentation to something that was much more upbeat and sometimes even a touch manic. But it is the contrast between these two elements that gives us the musical grist for his mill in each of these six movements. Exactly. Well, one more thing about the dumka. People always say, well, can you define what a dumka is? And I think the definition is very, very difficult. It's, it's a little bit like terroir and wine. You know, it's, it's, it's a marriage of meditative and hypnotic state, which is one of the reasons that this is a, really, it's, it's six semi-slow movements with lots of Czech dancing in the middle. So <laughs> it's not all slow, and it's definitely not all fast, but it is, in my opinion, a stream of consciousness that goes from the meditative mood to sort of throwing away the meditative mood, only to come back to the meditative mood. 
the genius of Dvorak's treatment is that he's often reusing the same melodic material when he changes the tempo and the texture and the mood, but you'll hear commonalities in the musical threads that run through it. When we were discussing this in preparation for today, Gary mentioned to me that he thought of it as a journey through someone's mind and soul. And we are all made up of different moods and different facets of our personality. And also it should be mentioned that a lot of the big themes, quote unquote, are given to the cello, which is the closest to the human voice. And so in many ways, a lot of the thematic material is introduced by the cello, which I think is in a way kind of a mirror to the domka, to the way it, it, the soul can, can reflect on something. And then the piano and the violin will pick it up. So domka is the singular, domki is the plural in the Czech language. And that is the perfect introduction to our first example, which is a dramatic opening in E minor. And listen to who's giving that cry of anguish. May we hear track 11, please. We have a cry of grief that to my ears looks forward to the early 20th century instrumental works and operas of Leos Janáček. We should mention that one of the very great 19th century cello concertos was written by Antonín Dvorak, and so he was very familiar with the instrument, with its capability, and most importantly, how it can be a solo instrument which takes the reins right here in the very opening. So at that very beginning, we have the cello in a really strong expressive range for the cello, and that particular example resolves into a mini recitative for the cello before it moves to the next section of the music. But in about two minutes, Dvorak, using the same melodic material, switches to E major, he started out in E minor, and he lightens things up at twice the tempo. Let's hear track 12, please. <laughs> you were listening carefully, you might have heard that the cello is playing the same theme at double tempo yeah. and in a higher register. And then the violin comes in dancing away and saying, oh, wow, this is my kind of music. So it's basically a metamorphosis of the grief with a, a real country check dance on top of it. And really a, a wonderful compositional uh, mechanism. And as Gary said before, it's a little bit like a musical stream of consciousness. Let's listen to track 13, which I think is from the same movement. And what you're gonna get here is when he really gets going. And the whole principle is variations on steroids. Let's hear track 13, please. <laughs> He wants to make sure that he's established this good mood before he goes back to another cry of grief. Yeah, it, the, the thing, when I was in the Czech Republic, we always ask about what is a dumka so they can explain it. And their point on this was that whatever your mood is, you're always guaranteed to change. Yes. So if you're in the middle of the it's dance... It's like the it's weather gonna, in North Texas. Exactly. <laughs> if you're in the middle of a dance, it's going to be bad. And if it's bad, it'll probably get better. <laughs> so it, it's never yeah. the same all the time. So we obviously don't have examples from all six of these movements, but we're, what we're trying to lay out for you is the general principles that govern each of these dumki that constitute this wonderful uh, piano trio that is unique in the literature. About the only thing comparable to it is Haydn's Seven Last Words. For Absolutely, Supreme I was Quartet. just thinking about that. And there you have narration and you have a, really a theater piece where this is more of the theater piece for your imagination. So in my last two clips, I've selected one that it gives us a window into the lush chromaticism that is so central to Dvorak's harmonic language toward the end of the 19th century. But he's really celebrating the string sound here. And the piano is limited to rolled chords that are just filling out that harmony. Let's hear track 14, please.
So we had the violin actually thickening the texture there too, but who had the solo? The cello has a solo, and actually the violin is in some ways tasked with playing the, both the tenor and the alto voice. So if you think of it like a piano quartet, you both have the viola and the violin lines with those double stops. So you know, he's, he's really changing textures of a different ensemble. Uh, Dvorak was himself. He started on violin, but he was an excellent violist, and he really understood how to write for the strings. I, I do have to throw them, him under the bus. So when we, were, <laughs> when we were rehearsing for this, I have to tell you a, a story, and it's not a secret because it's out there. So apparently when they premiered this, Dvorak played the piano, and some of his Czech colleagues played violin and, and cello. And at the end of the performance, there was a review that said the composer wrote a brilliant work, but he had a lot of trouble playing the piano <laughs> with his own notes. Yes. So apparently he had, he, he had a, a lot better compositional talent than he did uh, with his fingers. Yeah. And as much as we all love the Dvorak Piano Quintet, the beautiful Opus 81, 81. in A major, every pianist who plays it grouses about how unpianistic the yeah. piano but part is. But fortunately, the string lines are equally difficult. Yeah. <laughs> All right, the next uh, example I have is a fast section in minor mode, which kind of shows us that minor mode doesn't necessarily mean sad. And we hear a lot of this in Bach. A lot of the um, suites and partitas will have minor mode movements that are very dance-like. A mm -hmm. suite really is a collection of dances. But this is emphasizing the dance connection in the Dumka. Let's hear track 15, please. It's really hard to keep your feet still listening to this, isn't it? It's really fun stuff. And our last example gives us, it's not exactly a Rossini crescendo, but if you can think back to those years in the 40s and 50s where we learned a lot of our classical music from watching cartoons in and the early cops. days. And cops. Yes, exactly. What we're listening for in this last example is variety in tempo. We're going to hear acceleration and the way he uses the instruments. He's going to start with pizzicato and the strings and then he gets more dramatic and it's going to resolve in this big tremolando. It draws you in and each one of these movements has its own distinct character and its own split personality as you moved from the introspective sections to the more dance-like upbeat ones. Let's hear track 16, please. So Gary, is it fun to play? It's really fun to play, but this section is, is one of my favorites actually in the entire piece because the way I imagine it is you look at a dancer maybe like this picture where it starts out and the, one of the dancers at least is a little overweight and he's a little not elegant, but by the time you end the section, he's very athletic. So again, the stream of consciousness might overtake two, three, four, five months, but it starts out in a, in a different place. And we have to sort of imagine, is it because they gave him another glass of ale or because he was sobering up after processing the earlier glass of ale? Exactly. <laughs> there are lots of questions in this music, but ultimately it is a really joyous ride and we are so glad that all of you are here to share it with us this afternoon. Thank you for getting here early to listen to our introduction and enjoy the concert. Thank you.